Okay, so we have two more uh, papers, and then I thought we would we could have hopefully some time for questions collectively at the end. So it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dagmar Wojastik, uh, who's coming to us from the University of Zurich, where she's a research fellow, and writing her habilitation thesis, which uh, may German and continental systems, you write two PhD theses. She's written one, and she's on her second. Uh, her doctorate's from Bonn University in Germany, and she's worked at Cambridge as well. And she's the author of a, a book at, published by Oxford University Press in 2012 titled Well-Mannered Medicine, Medi Medical Ethics and Etiquette in Classical Ayurveda. Um, as I said, she's coming here from Zurich via Austria by way of London. So we thank her for enduring a rather um, arduous journey here by multiple planes, and we're very happy you're here, so welcome. about traditional South Asian medicine, about Ayurveda, um, which translates as the knowledge of long life or the science of longevity. Ayurveda is not a trademarked word, not a trademarked name, so it can mean different things to different people. You will find if you get an Ayurvedic treatment in the US, it probably will be vastly different from a treatment you would get in India in an Ayurvedic hospital. Um, I will be, it's a living tradition practiced in India today. The practice in India today is regulated by the government, as is Ayurvedic education. But I will today be speaking about the scholarly tradition of Ayurveda, or classical Ayurveda, which is characterized by its texts written in, mostly in Sanskrit, a textual tradition that spans about 2,000 years. Um, and uh, really, there is still literary production up to today in this classical tradition. I've chosen some pictures to sort of uh, characterize what I mean when I talk about classical Ayurveda. So I, I already talked about it being a literate tradition. There are some print editions of some of uh, the major Ayurvedic works. There are some plant materials. Probably from the 16th century onward, you should also add metals and minerals. But sort of early Ayurveda used mostly uh, plant materials in, in therapies. And then finally, the bottom picture there uh, shows a rishi, uh, because Ayurveda it understands itself to be a revealed knowledge. Now, the oldest text, and I'm going to talk a bit about textual transmission. I said before that it's about a 2,000-year-old tradition. Um, we can't be sure exactly how old it is. The oldest text that has been transmitted down to us is the Charaka Samhita, the collection of Charaka, which is usually dated to about the first century CE. Now, the reason to date it to the first century is sort of fairly vague. It's because uh, there is mention of a Charaka at Kanishka's court, uh, who was a doctor. And so that would have been the first century CE, so we think that probably the Charaka Samhita dates to about that time. However, the Charaka Samhita is the Charak's collection, um, which means it's a compilation of older texts. And indeed, the transmission history is very complicated, so that um, we really don't know how old the contents of this, uh, this work um, are. If Charaka lived in the first century, the text as he compiled it would have older materials, but then the texts were also uh, redacted again in the ninth century by the Rigabala, so that, in a way, it's both older and younger than the um, uh, first century CE. The next text I'll be speaking about will be the Sushruta Samhita, uh, Sushruta's collection, which is again dated to the third century, but has about the same problems as the Charaka Samhita. We don't know exactly when these texts were written or when they were compiled. We don't know where they were written, well, broadly in the South Asian continent. So you can see how, you know, with the problems of dating it and placing it, it's difficult to make out a cultural context for these texts, for 
broadly speaking, they're Hindu, early Hindu, post-Vedic, um, but they also display a lot of Buddhist influence, and you will come across it in my talk today. Generally speaking, um, these texts, they're medical texts, but they comprise a lot more than just medicine, or you know, they take a broad view on medicine. So you will find chapters on logic, on philosophy, there will be speculations about the nature of reality. There are whole chapters on ethics and etiquette, on, on good conduct, and I'll be talking about those quite a lot today. Um, I would like to talk about a specific um, aspect of Ayurvedic ethics, or Ayurvedic medical ethics, namely the role of honesty in the doctor-patient relationship. In most of the Ayurvedic texts, certainly the earliest ones, but really also the later ones, and I've checked texts up to the 18th century, you will find definitions of the perfect doctor, the ideal physician. And these are uh, standardly formulated as the four pillars of medicine. So you've got the perfect physician, the perfect patient, the perfect medicine, the perfect nurse or helper. And they all read pretty much the same. I've taken an example from Sushruta's collection. Uh, Sushruta is a surgical text, so it has a lot of surgery. So some of these things, that, uh, these things about being equipped with instruments is sort of typical for Sushruta. But the gist of the, the definition is the same in all of the works. So Sushruta says, the physician who has accurately studied the precepts and principles of the subject has observed its practice and practiced himself, who is light-handed, clean and strong, equipped with instruments and drugs, confident, sensible, determined and skilled, honest, and I've highlighted that, uh, and pious is known as a pillar of treatment. So you can see a very strong emphasis on knowledge and skill, but also uh, an emphasis on, let's say, a good character, an honest character and is complemented by the patient who is long-lived, resolute, curable, wealthy, <laughs> also prudent and faithful and attentive to what the doctor says. So this is also a pillar of treatment. So you can see the kind of relationship the doctor and patient would have had. It's a fraternalist relationship. This is not surprising in a text that is over 2,000 years old. The doctor knows best. The Ayurvedic doctor knows best. He's skilled. He's you know, he is supposed to really know what is best, and he gets to decide what will be done. And by the way, I'm saying he, now all the old texts only speak of, of um, male physicians. Of course, today in India, there are plenty of female physicians, and I think actually uh, that right now in Ayurvedic education and colleges, there might be more female graduates than male graduates. But, you know, 2,000 years ago, this was apparently not the case. So. The physician decides what's best, he decides what will be done, which information will be uh, given, what therapy will be done. But his um, decisions are not random, and um, they're informed by certain rules that he has vowed to keep. The Ayurvedic texts, all of the older ones, but also some of the newer ones, describe initiation rites for the medical student, um, in which the teacher tells the student how he's supposed to behave during his apprenticeship, but also how he's supposed to behave after he has commenced his own practice. In Charaka's version of this, the teacher advises that the student should speak gently, purely, justly, joyfully, in a wholesome manner, truthfully, affectionately, and moderately. So he should speak truthfully. This is not just about bedside manner. This is supposed to be his general conduct, how he would behave in everyday life as well as in the context of his practice as a physician. Now, generally speaking, the medical authors all advocate honesty as good conduct. I told you before that there are whole chapters dedicated to good conduct, to healthy living, but also to moral living. Charaka, for example, in his collection, states outright in a chapter on good conduct that one should not tell lies. He's very unequivocal about it. Telling lies is bad conduct. Telling the truth is good conduct. Um, you know, John, uh, honesty is generally portrayed as, as a good thing, a virtuous thing. It's the right thing. And it contributes to both an individual's but also society's happiness and health. You can see that a little bit from the um, quote below, which is from a 7th century work called The Heart of Medicine, Ashtanga Hridaya Samhita, 
uh, attributed to an author or rather compiler called um, Bagbata. The advice about good conduct is connected with um, both with health and with having a virtuous life. So they're very much interlinked. They cannot be taken away from each other. For the medical authors, good conduct is not just a matter of etiquette and social rules, but it's not just about how to move in polite society. It's really about a metaphysics that understands human behavior to have far-reaching consequences for the individual, for society, for the environment. To have good conduct, means for the individual happiness and health, but it also contributes to society's happiness and health, and even has consequences for the environment. And by contrast, bad conduct, so say lying, uh, would make an individual unhappy and would cause disease. And it would have similar implications for society as a whole. And so we can just say, you know, Honesty is important in the Ayurvedic classics. Honesty is part of good conduct. Nobody should lie. Everybody should be honest. A physician should be truthful. He should be honest. He should speak truthfully. And yet, in the Ayurvedic works, we find several contexts in which physicians are um, really told you know, that they should lie in certain circumstances, or at least withhold the truth, or use deception actively. So there are three circumstances in which this would be the case. The first is that they should lie to shield patients and their relatives or any others from harm. The second would be to ensure patient compliance, to make sure that uh, patients would get the therapies that they need. And the third is to bring about a certain therapeutic effect. And I now will explore these scenarios and see how, you know, talk about the tension between the Ayurvedic ethic of truthfulness and the coexisting ethic of medical expedience. So my first example is really very simple. It's about shielding patients and their relatives from harm. Now I mentioned the initiation rite for medical students uh, in which the teacher advised the student that he should speak gently and truly and so on and, and truthfully. But in the same talk, the physician then, uh, the teacher physician then goes on to describe uh, the future practice and how the uh, apprentice and the later physician should behave in the house of the patient. And there he says, if you know that the lifespan of the disease is diminished, you should not tell this in a situation in which by speaking about it, you would harm the diseased or another. So basically there's a differentiation between speaking truthfully and telling all that is to tell so this is really about sort of uh, withholding information. It's not exactly lying, but it's withholding the truth. And of course, it's based on the idea that there would be harm if the information was disclosed. So it's using the, the concept of uh, paternalism, of beneficence, according to which um, the, the well-being of the patient is central to any communication or interaction between physician and patient simple to understand. Now the second example or context in which a physician can lie or use deception is a bit more complicated. And this is about ensuring patient compliance, making sure that the patient gets the treatment he or she needs. It occurs in the context of wasting disease, consumption. So there are certain uh, foods that are recommended to be given to uh, patients who suffer from wasting disease. These people are dehydrated, they are emaciated, and certain meats, particular meats, are said to be particularly nourishing and strengthening. So we get a list of meats that are particularly good for these patients. The problem is that these are the exact meats that patients would not have wanted to eat. <laughs> so Charaka gives a sort of list of replacement names. So you're giving the patient the meat they wouldn't want to eat, but you call it something else. And I've given the list here, but I'll read you the passage. So Charaka says, to one who is dehydrated, he should give peacock and other meats under the name of peacock, namely vulture, owl, and blue jay, well prepared according to the rules. He should give crows under the name of partridge, and fried snakes under the name of fish, as well as earthworms. Uh, 
uh, under the name of fish entrails. I'm not sure fish entrails are that much better than that one. <laughs> a physician should give cooked jackals, large mongooses, cats and young jackals under the name of hare. To increase flesh, he should give lions, bears and hyenas, tigers and meat eaters of such a kind under the name of antelope. To increase flesh, the doctor should give the seasoned meat of elephant, rhinoceros and horse in the name of buffalo. He concludes, he should employ deception about those meats that aren't like, because they're unusual, because that way they can be eaten easily. Knowing what it was, because that way, um, uh, knowing what it was, feeling disgusted, the patient would not even eat or would cause what was eaten to come up again. Therefore, he should let such meats be administered after they have been disguised as something else. Now, there are many parallel passages in the other works, and Acharaka is not the only one who speaks about that. I've got another example, a shorter version of the same thing in the Ashnavatiya Samhita, in the essence of medicine, you have it in Sushrita, you have it in later works as well. Um, and this brings up some questions. You know, who were the patients who did not want to eat these kinds of meats? Um, the list of meats that are unusual includes several animals that are not actually meat eaters. You know, this was supposed to be a list of meat eaters, but we also had elephant, rhinoceros, and horse. And perhaps you also noticed uh, beef was not mentioned at all. So beef being sort of today thought of as a, as a kind of meat that uh, Hindus would never want to eat. In the Ayurvedic works, beef is used uh, a lot as a strengthening meat. And it's never discussed at all um, as uh, an ethical problem. But if we look at this, this list of sort of meat eaters plus elephant, rhinoceros, and horse, um, this seems to be going into the direction of religious food law. And indeed, an 11th century commentator on uh, Charaka's collection called Chakrapani Datta, a very important writer, um, commentator and also author in the Ayurvedic tradition, um, glosses Charaka's word unusual. You look back, you know, they said that they aren't like because they're unusual. He glosses this with um, they are not to be eaten. Just as a, a um, Abhakshyata, which is a technical term used in religious um, uh, law literature, um, so Brahmanic law literature, early Hindu law literature. For example, uh, we find um, a list of forbidden meats in Manu's Dharma Shastra, in Manu's um, Book of Law, one of the you know, oldest and probably the most important law books, Hindu law books. We find a list that pretty much corresponds to Charaka's list and also has animals that are not meat eaters. I should also say before concluding that clearly this is you know, Hinduism at work, that we also find um, a list uh, in the rules of discipline for Buddhist monks that uh, corresponds to Charaka's list as well. But if the meats listed in Charaka's um, uh, book were subject to food laws that his contemporaries actually adhered to, their use in therapy should really have you know, serious ethical implications. You know, you could imagine a number of problems arising. Patients could be spiritually tainted by eating forbidden foods. You know, maybe they should do some ritual to, you know, make up for the use of impure foods. Maybe intentionality would have played a role. You know, did they know what was they were taking and does that make a difference? And indeed, um, well, we'll come to that. And actually, in the Sushruta Samhita, um, we have this in the parallel passage. Sushruta says, a man should eat meats of meat eaters according to rule. The flesh of one whose mind is pure grows through meat. And in the commentary, which was written about a thousand years later, um, the commentary says, the meats of lions, etc., are given under disguise, thus, of one whose mind is pure. And I think that's a sort of argument in favor of intentionality. So this clears the patient of guilt, the guilt of having taken an impure substance. What about the physician? You know, does this, this implicate the physician in committing an offense, you know, first by handling impure stuffs, and then by maybe committing a bad deed by giving it to patients? Well, the, uh, unfortunately, the texts actually don't discuss this at all. We do, however, have a comment, again, by Chakrapani Datta, and here I've got a different print edition of the Charaka's collection because it includes Chakrapani Datta's commentary, um, the Ayurveda Deepika light on Ayurveda. And there Ch uh, Chakrapani Dutta says um, that the rules of Ayurveda do not teach the achievement of righteousness, rather they teach the achievement of health. 
Now, I've got to say, I don't actually agree with Chakrapali Datta because, you know, there are these whole sections on ethics and etiquette and on good conduct and on a virtuous life. So I think Ayurveda does indeed teach a virtuous life. But perhaps we can understand this as, you know, what the main aim of the physician should be, his dharma, as it were, namely to cure or at least to help the patient. Coming back to the topic of honesty, though, Chakrapani uh, Datta has, uh, you know, asked a further very relevant question. I um, quoted him, bef uh, quoted Charaka before in the section on good conduct. Charaka said, uh, you know, do not tell a lie. And Chakrapani Datana asks, well, before you said do not tell a lie, here you say we should lie about the meats. So isn't that a contradiction? He answers his own question by saying that it's not a contradiction, since the guilt of speaking falsehood is incurred by speaking untruth that results in harming another, but not by speaking untruly for the sake of another's life. So, in other words, truth, or rather untruth, it can be morally qualified. It's only a vice when used to harm others, it's acceptable when used for a good cause. The underlying principle here is that whatever needs to be done to ensure patient compliance, to ensure that the patients get the treatment they need, to ensure the success of therapy, uh, may or indeed ought to be done. And the goal justifies the means. We come to the third circumstance where a physician should use deception or should lie. And this is about bringing about a certain therapeutic effect. The context is treatment against a certain type of madness, uh, um, which is interpreted as being or categorized as paitika, that is um, associated with um, a humoral imbalance, in this case the humor pitta or bile. Um, Charaka prescribes certain ways of interacting with the patient that is part of the therapy. Now this is a pretty sort of, this is a bit of a shocking read when you read this. And I should point out that this is not typical for Ayurvedic therapy. This is sort of extreme <coughs> therapy used in one specific case in this kind of madness about which we might actually hear more in the next talk by Fred Smith. So here the prescription goes as follows. A friend should encourage him with words of religious merit and wealth so far so good, or tell him of the death of a beloved one, or show him surprising things. <coughs> or, after he has been fettered and oiled with mustard oil, one should lay him down stretched out on the back in the sun. Now that would have been very painful. Mustard oil really stings the skin. Being put in the sun, you would have a very strong burning sensation. This would not be pleasant. Or one should touch him with velvet bean. Velvet bean has um, irritant bristles. It's like being touched by stinging nettles or with heated metal, oil, or water, I think that needs no explanation, or having struck him with whips, one should confine him firmly fettered in a deserted house, for his confused mind thus comes to rest. The next section is a bit more relevant to the topic of honesty. It goes on, so one should scare him with a snake, whose fangs have been extracted, or with tamed lions and elephants, or with robbers or enemies holding knives, or otherwise, royal officers, policemen, should take the well-restrained patient outside and should scare him, threatening to kill him on the king's order. For the fear of one's life is thought to exceed fears of bodily pain. So this is the better treatment. You know, the sort of hurting is good, scaring him is better. Through this, his disordered mind comes to rest. So several other treatises describe similar treatments, and you know this is sort of you know this is the sort of accepted therapy for people suffering from paitika or mada, from pitta-induced madness. So what's happening in these treatments? Now, apart from the initial suggestion that they, uh, you know, a friend should encourage him with words of religious merit and wealth, they're all characterized by various degrees of violence to the patient. You know, a low level of violence lies in the telling of sad news, and these may be quite untrue. Uh, but true or not, are probably intended to let the patient experience anguish or strong grief. Whipping, burning, fettering, isolating the patient are more marked displays of violence. And the idea is to induce fear. Fear for his life, probably. However, the central method of treatment is the use of threat. Each threat of being bitten by a snake, attacked by lions or elephants, assaulted by robbers or enemies, or executed by royal officers on the king's orders, 
is aimed at making the patient feel for his life. However, Charach indicates quite clearly that the threats are just that. You know, at no time is the patient's life actually in danger. You know, the fangs of the snake have been removed, the elephants and lions are tamed. You kind of wonder where they got those lions. <laughs> and, um, you know, probably robbers and enemies would not have been at the physician's disposal or either royal officers. So there's, you know, there's play acting. Um, as there is no true intention of harming the patient, the threat is therefore act, an act of deception. The treatment success relies on the contrasting perspectives uh, the participants in this medical drama have. So while the doctor or carer or royal officer uh, does not intend to actually commit the violent act or to let it happen, to let harm come to the patient, uh, it is crucial that the patient believes that he does. The violent fear that the patient experiences is his therapy. And therefore, deception is used as a therapeutic tool. Um, I'll come to the end. I'll just quickly summarize again. So honesty is really central to Ayurvedic ethics. It's a good thing. It's good conduct. It has repercussion for the individual, for society, for the environment at large. And yet there are certain circumstances in which the physician really must lie or at least withhold the truth. Uh, and the contexts are to shield the patient from harm in the context of uh, giving him upsetting news, to ensure patient compliance, making sure the patient gets the treatment he or she needs, and then in the end, uh, used as a therapeutic tool, um, so deception itself is the thing that will make the patient better. So perhaps we can reformulate Charaka's dictum, one should not tell lies to, you should not tell lies unless they're therapeutic. Thank you.